Hello, my name is Charwan Choi. Today I will be going over three topics that are important in improving audio recognition. These topics are echo cancellation, audio derogation, and source localization. These topics are important in improving acoustic interactions with the avatar. I will go over these topics in the order they have been presented. First, I will explain why we need to study these topics and why we need them in our living social robot. Then I will explain the past and current works and uh, in these topics and I will explain how the artificial intelligence has played a role in these topics. And I will explain the research issues and challenges that these topics have faced. And I'll show you the pipeline for each of these topics. And then I'll tell you the challenges they face still. And then I'll tell you the conclusion. First, the motivation. Why do we need any of these topics? What are echo cancellation, speaker derogation, and sound source localization for? Well, consider a situation like this, where our social robot is in a room with two people. Let's say the social robot is making a noise, and the two people are also speaking, sometimes in turn, and sometimes together, and whatnot. Now, in this situation, the social robot would be hearing the echo of its own voice bouncing off the walls and it would also be hearing the speaker's voice and it would also hear the noise from the background. Echo cancellation, speaker derogation and sound source localization are all for helping out the social robot in such a situation. <clears throat> First, I will go over echo cancellation as this is a problem that is common for lots of sound-based experiments. Everyone knows that echoes are extremely annoying on the phone calls. And it is also a given that an audio file filled with echoes is harder to interpret accurately than an audio file without echoes. Then in order to understand how to cancel echoes, we must first understand what echoes are. A simple explanation of the echo is that it is an reflected copy of one's voice that is heard a few seconds later. You can confirm this easily by going up to a mountain and shouting into distance. You will soon hear a voice saying the same thing coming back. However, while echoes in the mountain are amusing to see, rather hear, Echoes in electronics are not so amusing. In electronics, echoes can be divided into two types. The acoustic echo and the line echo. <coughs> the acoustic echo is the sound from the speaker being picked up by the microphone. The line echo is an electrical impulse caused by coupling between the sending and receiving wires, impedance mismatches, and such. Basically, the acoustic echo is the type of echo we intuitively expect, where the sound from the speaker goes into the microphone and is sent back to the other side. This usually or happens on phones and the uh, line echo is a problem with hardware and 
Line echoes usually vary much less than acoustic echoes. However, both types of echoes can be dealt with using the same method in acoustic echo cancellation. Ever since the develop ever since the invention of telephones, echo suppression and echo cancellation have been studied subjects. They are commonly called acoustic echo suppression or AES for short and acoustic echo cancellation or AEC for short. The acoustic echo suppression and the acoustic echo cancellation were both studied for a long time. However, they are both different methods used to solve the same problem. However, due to some problems in the acoustic echo suppression, acoustic echo cancellation became more popular and now, in today's society, acoustic echo suppressions are often used as a part of acoustic echo cancellers. Acoustic echo suppression works by detecting a voice going in one end of the circuit and then muting or attenuating the signal in the other direction. Basically, if we say that speaker A is near end, well, speaker A is near end and speaker B is far end, when speaker A speaks, the echo suppressor would mute speaker B so that speaker A's voice coming out of fr from speaker B's side wouldn't go back into speaker A's microphone and be relayed back to speaker A. This is a quite easy, simple concept to grasp. However, it had many problems, such as the double talk, clipping, and dead set. These problems occurred largely because there are so many cases when people on both sides speak at the same time, and because the echo suppressor is constantly alternating between muting and unmuting each side whenever the speaker changes. So for the first problem with the echo suppressor, the double talk. The double talk is something that happens when both speakers are muted because loss is inserted for both directions at once. Basically it's a case where since echo suppressors mute the other side when it detects voice from one side. It's a case where both sides speak at the same time and because of that both sides are muted at the same time. To prevent this problem, echo suppressors can be set to fail to send loss when both sides are speaking. However, this just defeats the purpose of the echo suppressor. Another problem is clipping. This problem occurs because the echo suppressor is alternating between inserting and removing loss every time a new speaker begins speaking. This causes a slight delay when a new speaker starts speaking, causing the first syllable of that speaker's speech to be clipped. The third problem is something that's called dead set. This problem is really a problem exclusive to human communication. This is because it's a problem based on the perception and the mental understanding of humans. Human mind playing tricks. So it wasn't technically occurred to our living social robot. This problem is occurs when speaker A is, for example, when speaker A is speaking and he stops speaking, when he, speaker A stops speaking and speaker B starts speaking, speaker A would go mute. When speaker A goes mute, so does everything, every sound coming from speaker A's side, including background noise. In speaker B's perspective, it would seem like speaker A's line has suddenly gone dead because 
of the sudden silence, sudden absolute silence from Speaker B, uh, Speaker A's side. This isn't really inherently damaging anything, but it creates a. It is bound to create a misunderstanding. Anyways, due to these regions in today's society, echo cancellation is used much more than echo suppressions. And echo suppressions are sometimes used as a part of echo cancellers. Now, let us talk about what echo cancellers are. Echo cancellers work by they work by reproducing the far end signal delivered to the system and then filtering it and delaying it to resemble the near end signal. This filtered far end signal is then subtracted from the near end signal which results in a signal that represents sounds in the room excluding any direct or reverberated sound. What this means is that when speaker A speaks, uh, if we consider speaker A to be the near end and speaker B to the, be the far end, when speaker B speaks, it, oh, in this picture on the right over here, it explains the acoustic echo cancellation method. The far end would be the downlink signal, and the I will call it the mic bottom right, uh, bottom left, the microphone signal. We can see that the microphone signal includes both the echo and the speech. The echo coming from the speaker on the near end. So when the far end signal is delivered to the voice terminal, the system. It is reproduced and delayed and filtered and sent this filtered copy is sent to the AEC, the acoustic echo canceller. And the unfiltered version is just sent straight to the speaker in the near end. And the speaker lets out the sound, the downlink signal, and this becomes the echo that goes into the microphone along with the speech from the near end signals speaker A and these go into the AEC acoustic echo canceller and in this acoustic echo canceller the filtered signal is subtracted from the speaker's microphone signal which includes both the echo and the speech we can see that the resulting uplink signal is only the green part so the echo is this has disappeared this is because the downlink signal which is basically the echo has been removed from the the mixture after well yes <clears throat> so the resulting uplink signal basically only has the sounds from the room A, excluding any direct or reverberated sounds from speaker B. The key point of the acoustic echo cancellers is the filtering to apply to the far end signal. This filter is essentially a model of the speaker, the microphone, and the room's acoustical attributes. As the characteristics of the near-end speaker's microphone and near-end speaker are usually unknown in advance, and more importantly, they can easily change because the speaker can move around and the microphone can be moved as well. Anyways, because of this, these properties, these changing properties get, that can change at any time, the echo cancellers have to be adaptive. I have talked about 
echo cast how echo cancellers work a little too much but now I'll talk about the speaker derogation and why we need speaker derogation so speaker derogation basically answers the question of who spoke when in a situation where there are multiple people speaking sometimes people will speak after one after the other and sometimes people will interrupt one another and sometimes people will speak all at the same time. In order, in order for the social robot to make use of such a mixed sound audio file, it needs to be able to recognize who is speaking when, especially when it wants to do tasks like speech recognition because otherwise you could have some audio file that have weird speeches that simply don't make sense. This picture shows speaker direct speaker derogation very well. In the first picture where it says audio analyzed, it shows the waveform containing multiple speakers where sometimes speaker A is speaking, sometimes speaker B is speaking. And sometimes both people are speaking at the same time. And after speaker derogation, these speakers are separated into different channels where each channel contains one speaker. That is basically the goal of speaker derogation. And this is it's extremely useful for speak, speech identification. As for sound source localization, well, sound source localization is use, useful for many things. It has many practical applications. For instance, you can be used for source separation, automatic speech recognition, and speech enhancement. It can also be useful for human robot interaction in that when a social robot is walking around, it's often the case that the camera can't see everyone who is talking, or it can be the case that the camera is simply facing away from the speaker. Sound source localization basically locates the, where the source of the sound is, and well, that is useful for many directions as I mentioned before. However, this is actually isn't quite a mandatory subject, though it is extremely useful when applied to a social robot. In fact, it is so useful that many of the social robots in the past already have sound source localization installed on them. These are some robots that have sound source localization. The SIG robot on the left was the sounds was a humanoid robot designed to or built to promote the audition as a basic skill for robots in 2000. Initially, there wasn't much interest in sound source localization, especially in the robot department or artificial intelligence department. However, with the appearance of the SIG robot, the study in sound source localization became popular. There were studies on sound source localization before this, of course, but SIG robot is why they became popular. It should also be noted that initially, sound source lo most sound source lo studies in sound source localizations use two microphones for binaural sound source localization. This was to mimic human hearing as humans are able to do this naturally. However, as more and more studies 
came out for sound source localization, more studies started using more microphones. And on the right, we can see that the Spartacus robot and the humanoid HRP2 robot use eight microphones each for sound source localization. As for trends in AI regarding the topics, for acoustic echo cancellation, the initial methods of acoustic echo cancellation was simply the algorithm you see here on the left. It didn't have anything to do with AI or deep learning models. And in the middle is the basic formula for acoustic echo cancellation. This formula is basically the or D formula and anything to do with acoustic echo cancellation usually doesn't stray far from this. You could add things to it and make it more complicated, make a little twist here and there, but overall it will always follow follow this formula. And as for when AI started being used in acoustic echo cancellation, to my knowledge, the earliest it was used was in 1998, when a group decided to create an acoustic echo cancellations for non-linear or non-linear acoustic echo cancellation. This was created because in the real world, you can't only use, expect to use linear acoustic cancellations. And you can see here that the neural networks were used for non-adaptive filters and the error signal. This model is just or this diagram is just one of many diagrams for a nonlinear acoustic echo cancellers, as different models can have different diagrams, especially in here. For speaker derogation, the first was the auto associative neural network in 2009. After that, the RCNN, the recurrent CNNs, were more popular in, since 2017. They remained popular until 2021 when their attention-based models began becoming popular. The first attention-based model used in speaker derogation was in 2018, but it did not catch on until 2021. As for sound source localization, the first was the 2011's multilayer perceptrons. After a few years, in 2017, the use of CNNs for sound source localization became popular, and to, in 2019, they started using CRNNs. And these two models basically dominate the market in, for using deep models to uh, for sound source localizations. However, in 2020, there have been many t attempts in using different models for sound source localizations, such as the UNET autoencoders, variational autoencoders, and attention based models. However, this does not mean that CNNs and CRNNs became less popular. It simply means that there were many new attempts in year 2020. One re well, 
another reason I want to implement these topics into the living social robot is that now we have lots of things that were unavailable in the past now available to us that enables us to implement these into a living social robot. These things re include toolboxes for speaker derogation and sound source localization, open sources for things like algorithms, for CNNs, CRNNs, UNET and the likes and sound source localization methods and even adaptive filters for acoustic echo cancellations and speaker derogation. We also have more data sets than before, both synthetic and real data. These include RIR, room impulse response, survey binaural Im room impulse responses, and DK's challenge data sets. We also have new augmentation methods to augment the data set we have, including spec augment, mix up, pitch shifting, and block mixing. Now I'll explain some of the works for the each of these topics. Well, I already ex explained how the acoustic echo cancellation works. That formula never really quite changed. The acoustic echo cancellers are measured by the echo return loss and the echo return loss enhancement. The echo return loss is the ratio expressed in decibels of the original and the each echo. Higher value ERL means the echo is very weak, while low value means that the echo is very strong. When the ERL is negative, it means that the echo is actually larger than the original signal, and this can cause an audio feedback. And the ERLE, the echo return loss enhancement, is the amount of additional signal loss applied by the echo, I mean, applied by the echo canceller. This is expressed in decibels. And it is the, rather, the total signal loss of the echo, ACOM, is the sum of the ERL and ERLE. And this is the basic pipeline for an acoustic echo cancellation model. For speech derogation, there are a few steps to take. First, we need speech detection. This is basically to separate the speech from the background noise in the audio recording. The speech that is then separated, well, we then extract short segments from the speech audio and then we put the embedded speech segments together and create a neural network for these segments. These segments are, or they can be translated into different things, different data formats and sources such as text, images, and documents, and so on. They can also be or used for deep learning frameworks, used by deep learning frameworks. Anyways, after creating the embeddings of the segment, we can cluster these embeddings and the, we can label the clusters by the number of speakers. 
and then we can segment the audio into individual clips for each number of or for each speaker and this is the pipeline for speaker derogation For, for sound source separation, there were really a lot of models for them. This is especially because there are many parameters that can be changed for each model, for each experiment. These param parameters include the direction of arrival estimation by some type such as regression or classification, the learning method which includes supervised, self-supervised, and weekly supervised, and the number of sources which can range from 0 to 8 so far as I know, and the knowledge of the sources, number of sources, which is incredibly dangerous. because that changes quite everything. We also have to consider if the sources are moving or not. And we also need to know the type of data that was used to train the sources. They can be four types, synthetic, anechoic, which means an artificial data set with a without any echoes, real anechoic, which means a real anechoic data. And we also have synthetic reverberant, which is artificial data set without, uh, with echoes. And we also have real reverberant, which, uh, which means real data set with echoes as well. Before going into the sound source separation itself, it is necessary to make a few assumptions to simplify the problem. Most people make the assumption that it is a free field and far field situation, which means that Free, where free field means that there are no objects in the path to the microphone between the speaker and the microphone. Far field assumption assumes that the relation between the intermicrophone distance and the sound source is such that the sound wave can be considered planar. As for the direction of arrival, that disregards the intermicrophone distance. And it also it's basically the direction where your head would be facing if you were to just face the source of the sound. We and most studies for this subject use the spherical coordinate uh, there are times that you use Cartesian coordinate but most works regarding this subject use spherical coordinates. Another thing to know is the time difference of arrival. This time difference of arrival is literally what it says. It's the time between the, when the sound hits mic B, mic 
two and the, when the sound hits my A. And this is the complete data pipeline of an end-to-end -end sound source le localization methodology. Well, we can see that we first extract the feature here. We then use some propagation me measure and we also map the features to location mapping. And then we get the localization result. <clears throat> Anyways, when we do feature extraction, there's actually a lot of features we can e extract. <clears throat> mm -mm. Speaking of feature extraction, there are a lot of features we can extract. First, we have the RTF, the Relative Transfer Function. The RTF is the ratio of acoustic transfer functions between two sensors. It can be used for sound source localization. It is also used for echo cancellation as well. You can see the formula for RTF over here in the case where there's no noise. Anyways, <clears throat> the RTF is defined for a given sound source position and for a microphone pair as the ratio of sound to microphone ATFs of the two microphones, A1 and A2. And the ATF here is called the acoustic transfer function. Anyways, this is strongly dependent on the source direction of arrival. And an acoustic fun transfer function is defined as the relationship between a sound level of, of the source and the sound level at some point, some remote point known as the receiver. So, in a multi-channel setup, when we have more than two microphones, we can define an RTF for each microphone pair. Often, one microphone is used as a reference microphone, and the ATFs of all other microphones are divided by the ATF of this reference microphone. Anyways, another prop, rather another ex feature to extract is binaural features. I've already mentioned this before, but binaural features were extracted for two mi microphones or two microphone situations, and they are useful for both conventional and deep systems to attempt to reproduce human hearing as deeply or as realistically as possible. In an anechoic binaural environment, the two-channel source to microphone impulse response is referred to as binaural impulse response or BIR. And the frequency domain of this BIR is the HRTF, which stands for Head Related Transfer Function, which characterizes how a human ear receives sounds from a point in space. We also have the interaural level difference, which is the short term log power magnitude of the ratio between the two binaural channels in the SDFT domain. 
there's also the interaural phase difference and the interaural time difference. The interaural time difference is the delay that maximizes the cross correlation between two, the two channels. Speaking of cross correlation, there are features based on cross correlation. The TDOA I mentioned earlier, the time difference of arrival can be estimated with cross correlation. There is also something called GCC fat, PHAT, and this feature is a common feature in used in the local classification method, or in the classical lo classif localization methods. This feature is less sensitive to speech variations than the standard cross-correlation features, but more robust towards the noise and reverberations. <clears throat> this GCC FAT is the generalized cross-correlation with phase transform and it is one of the most employed methods when dealing with a two microphone array. And this method can be extended for arrays with more than two microphones by take then it yes. It is computed as the inverse Fourier transform of a weighted version of the cross power spectrum between the signals of the two microphones. Traditional localization methods such as the MUSIC, which is, stands for Multiple Emitter Location and Signal Parameter e Estimation, and ESPRIT, which stands for Estimation of Signal Parameters via Rotational Invariance Techniques, are based on the eigen decomposition of the cross-correlation matrix of a multi-channel recording. Several DNN-based so sound source localization methods are inspired by these and use the same features. Well, this here is the spectrum-based features. For spectrum-based features, there's no pre-processing in the channel dimension and multi-channel spectrograms are organized as 3D tensors and some systems only consider the magnitude spectrograms and others consider only the phase spectrograms and if you consider both they can be stacked in a third dimension. It is also possible to use male spectrograms instead of normal spectrograms and many models in the line in this line, use spectral or spectral temporal features instead of raw waveforms as inputs. Because of this, the network input uh, is a size of mk, where the m is the number of microphones and k is the number of considered STFT frequency bins. Next, we have the final feature we're introducing today, the intensity-based features. The sound intensity has been largely ignored by the sound source to localization community. This is because while it is useful, we need to be able to measure the particle velocities which require specific sensors. Under certain conditions, the particle velocity can be assumed to be proportional to the spatial gradient of the sound pressure, but it is still in development. 
The sound intensity is a useful pro property and it is a complex vector whose real part is proportional to the gradient of the phase of the sound pressure. The imaginary part is related to the oscillatory local energy transfers and its physical interpretation is less obvious. Going over the learning methods, we have the first, we have the su supervised learning method, which I believe all of us know, but I'll go over it anyways. For the supervised learning method, the data set contains the corresponding label for each input data. And it has a cost function used to quantify the error between the output target and an actual output for a given input data. The training cost consists of minimizing this loss. In the single class single source cl classification localization, the categorical cross entropy is generally used as the loss. In the multi source classification localization, the segment activation function is and a binary cross entropy func loss function are used. In any case, supervised learning requires a lot of da labeled data. For weekly supervised learning, well, in the present it's basically like semi-supervised learning and semi-supervised learning is when part of the learning is done in a supervised manner and another in, is done in an unsupervised manner. And in the present, present <clears throat> usually the network is pre-trained pre on a supervised manner and it is fine-tuned in an unsupervised manner. This was done to improve performance in situations where the conditions were that the network was not trained for in a supervised manner. Now I'll go over the direction of arrival estimation methods. First, I explained that there were two methods for this, one by classification and the other by regression. First, the classification method. It basically divides the search space into regions, zones that are represented by classes. Basically, each class represents a certain zone in the search, search space, and it basically spits out which, which zone has the sound source coming from, the sound source is in. It can be used for both single source and multi-source localizations, and it mostly works with spherical coordinate. The other method, regression method, doesn't divide the zones into classes and instead it gives a estimation value given by a continuous value instead of a zone. For this case, the number of sources have to be known or assumed. 
here it can be more precise but we cannot uh, we cannot use this if we don't know the number of sources beforehand and we also don't know which estimates have to be associated with which target Now I'll go over the some research issues and challenges they have. First, with echo cancellation, determining the natural nature of the filter to be applied at the far end such that it resembles the near and resultant near end signal is something that it's always being studied for more efficiency. There's also a problem with real-time synchronization of streams and audio because well that is difficult to achieve second with speaker derivation most speaker derivation methods assume an entire recording is available for the speaker derivation, when in reality it's entirely possible that there's only snippets of recordings where some sentences may be cut in the middle. There's also the question of integrating the speaker derivation, derivation into ASR, Automatic Speech Recognition. This is something that is already being worked on. Sound source localization has lots of issues as well. First, it is difficult to have, a, it is difficult to measure the distance between the sound source and the microphones. For this, people have tried using multiple intensity vectors. However, it is still an area under study. Second, there is the lack of training data. For this, there is our synthetic data, and we can use semi-supervised learning, and they can use data augmentation. Also, we have to consider the echo and the noises in sound source localization but we can also use echo cancellation for that and most importantly there's the issue of situations where the assumption isn't applied such as the free field far field assumption what if there is something between the speaker and the sound source well, speaker and the microphone these are some issues that have to be worked out in the future. Oh, and I forgot for the sound source localization pipeline. No, did I forget it? Yes, I have. No, I haven't, but this is basically the sound source localization outline, very simplified version of it where you input the signal and extract the features and imp use the features to uh, feed into the some deep learning model and get the direction of arrival estimate. In conclusion, well, I believe that Uh, we can integrate the speaker derivation into automatic speech recognition and I also believe that combining classification with regression for sound source to find the direction of arrival can help improve sound source localization. I also believe that the we can also use visual information to improve upon sound source localization and
right now is the right time to apply these to our avatar based services because we have all the technology available and not quite developed so we can actually improve on the technology and we already know which direction we have to head to solve most of the problems that are visible however we still need to face the fact that there's still a lack of data for sound source localization and so we need more data and augmentation for that area. Thank you.